Good morning. My name is Gideon Impeni, a pastor of Florida Baptist Church. Um, we welcome you to our online service. I would like to ask you this morning, have you ever found yourself worrying, complaining as to how things are going in your life? Have you found yourself in this time uh, complaining a lot, coming before God, and you've been wondering as to what is the Lord doing in this time? Ever found yourself in this time that things are not going your way, and you've been asking questions and asking questions before the Lord, and it seems as if like there is no answer. If you have done that, then you find yourself in, in the company of the many men who have lived before us and who have come and they have been there faithfully serving the Lord. And one of the men that I would like to invite you, and we're going to look into this man this morning, is a man named Habakkuk. Habakkuk served, it was a contemporary of Jeremiah, and he will, him and Jeremiah will be the last prophets of Judah before the Lord will bring about invasion of the Babylonians upon Judah. Judah's last warning will come through these two men, Jeremiah and Habakkuk. And at this particular time, Habakkuk finds himself in a time, in a moment, when he will come before the Lord and he prayed to God. And we've been looking at that together for the past weeks. We saw Habakkuk bringing his first complaint to the Lord. And we saw him bringing a second complaint to the Lord to, before the Lord. And what we are going to do this morning, we are going to examine the last part of Habakkuk's second complaint. Because it is very vital for us even in such a time as this that we are living in, a time of a lockdown. And as you've heard, we are now, now on day number 30 in our lockdown, and we are going into more days that as the Church of Jesus Christ. It is unlikely that we are going to be meeting anytime soon. But in times such as this, should we worry? In times such as this, should we doubt on the goodness of God? In times such as this, we may even wonder to say, has the Lord forgotten his church? I bet you say that. I want you then to turn your Bibles as we about even to go to Habakkuk. I just want you to, and me to once again fix our minds on the Word of God. Listen to what the Word of God has to say. And I would invite you this morning to turn your Bibles to Psalm 37. And we are going to focus on verse 1 or the way to verse 8. Listen to what the Bible has to say this morning in Psalm chapter 37. And we are going to read in Psalm 37 from verse 1 all the way to verse 8. And listen to what the psalmist has to say. It is a psalm of David. And the heading in my Bible, this is ESV, the heading in my Bible, it says he will not forsake his sins. It is a psalm of David. David says, Fleck not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. For they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Listen to what David says in verse 6, in verse 5. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in Him, and He will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light. And what else is he going to do? And justice as your noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fled not yourself over the evildoers, over the one who prospers in his ways, over the man who carries out evil desires. 
verse 8. I love this verse. I love it. I love it. What does David say? Refrain from anger. Forsake wrath. What is David saying in verse 8? I just want you to ponder on that verse. Refrain. What David is saying, he says, cease. Stop. Stop from anger. Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. Why? For it tends only to evil. That's what the psalmist is saying this morning. And as we look upon this psalm and we, we see what David is calling us, and he, he has a number of commands that he brings out in that psalm that are worth the pondering on for us, even in such a time as this. He goes on to say in verse 3, trust in the Lord. In verse 5, in verse 4, he said, delight yourself in the Lord. In verse 5, he says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. Therefore, knowing that our God is good, knowing that our God will not forsake us, even this morning, as we are about to come to him, I'd like to invite you that we come before him this morning and we pray, asking him that he'll be with us, even as we will look into his word. Shall we bow before him this morning and we pray together? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you this morning. We say thank you. We say thank you because you love us. We say thank you because you are God who is good. We say thank you because you are the God who never leave nor forsake us. You have promised in your word that I will never leave you nor forsake you. But I will be with you unto the ends of the age. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for the body of Christ. We thank you for all the promises in you, Jesus. Uh, yes and amen. We thank you that you have loved your church, you have purchased her by your blood, you have called her to yourself, and we pray this morning that you'll be glorified. Even as we come to your word, we ask that you strengthen your church. We ask that you will, oh God, once again, gladden our hearts, knowing that you are a faithful God. But grant within us the required posture you expect of us, that even in such a time as this, we will trust in you. We will look up to you. We will know your comfort and your peace. That if there are some among us so far that who have trials and tribulations, you would, oh God, in a special way, minister to them. As your word goes out across the city, as your word goes out across the nations, we ask that you would, oh God, minister to your people in your mighty way. We pray that your word will not return to your void, but let it accomplish that which you send it for. It is for the glory of Christ and for the good of his church, we pray. And may God's people say, Amen. So turn with me this morning to the book of Habakkuk. And we find ourselves in Habakkuk chapter 2. And we are in verse 1. That's where we are this morning. Habakkuk chapter 2, <coughs> verse 1. Habakkuk uh, finishes his prayer, but for the sake of... So let us read together from the book of Habakkuk, and we will read from chapter 2, verse 1, and listen to the words of Habakkuk, and this is where we are going to focus this morning. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower. And look out to see what he will say to me and what I, will, what I will answer concerning my complaint. That is Habakkuk coming to the conclusion of his second complaint. And this is where I want us to focus on this morning in the hustle, in the bustle of city life. It is, it is also in this time when we are faced with coronavirus. And we are faced with the reality that we might not be going to church anytime soon. It is easier for us than to also lose sight of the, uh, the goodness of God. And we've seen what Habakkuk here has been doing. Habakkuk had asked God two questions in chapter 1. You remember that? He, he was asking God, why don't you do something? He's also asking God, why are you using the wicked against the righteous? Are you, are, 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 you, are you so holy and so righteous and so perfect that you could and you can even allow the wicked to come and punish the wicked? And so we see God's prophet here. He's perplexed. 
What, what is this but a triumph of evil in his mind? He's wondering, is, is there a divine providence here? Is, is there a just ruler of the world? He wonders to see what he is seeing in his time. But brothers and sisters, we focused last week and we saw this, that God's promise is as sure as his character is good. And Habakkuk found God's character the solace he saw needed at this particular time. He focused and he zoomed in on the character of God. He looked at the God who is perpetual. He said, you are from everlasting. He looked at a God who is personal. He says, my Holy One, my God. He looked at a God who is powerful in his, in his, in his dealings. And he say, you are the one who has ordained them. You are the one who has established them. So he, he understands in his mind, just as we should understand that if God sends pain, his purpose is to profit our souls. But also we need to understand as, as Habakkuk would come to, to understand here that if, if our Heavenly Father sends bitterness, then it is for our betterment. God cares for our character more than he cares for our comfort. He desires that we all conform to the image of his dear son, Jesus. And that is what we see here. We see and we are going to realize here that God will send even sorrow sometimes for our salvation. And we, we know in the book of 1 Corinthians, godly sorrow leads to repentance. So God's very character assures us of these things. And Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 12 reveals us to that, to that reality. Are you not from everlasting? Habakkuk says, my God, my Holy One. And Habakkuk is assured and as he says, we shall not die. So then, and as you go into chapter 3, I want you to see there's a transition that takes place in the life of Habakkuk. Habakkuk as a man, he starts with complaining. He starts as a man with a burden in chapter 1. He starts as a man full of wonder and worry in chapters 1 and chapter, uh, as we begin uh, in chapter 2. Chapter 2 is a hinge. Chapter 2 is pivotal in the writing of Habakkuk. He moves from this man who is restless, chapter 1 and chapter 2, as we see at the beginning of chapter 2, as a man who is focusing on the problem with God. He's a man who has a problem with God. But then he moves from this man with a burden to be a man with to a blessing. He moves from worry and wonder to worship in chapter 3. He moves from restlessness to rest in God. He moves from focusing on the problem with God to the person of God. That's where he moves to. Now the question is, how does Habakkuk arrive to that? How does he arrive? How does he move from burden to blessing? How does he move from worry to worship? And how can you do that in times such as this? Maybe you are there and you're listening to this. You, 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 you found yourself and you, you've looked at your life the past months or the past year, or even, even as you have looked at yourself, maybe you are not saved. Your life has been as if you've been carrying this burden upon your shoulder. You worry and you wonder. You focus on the problem with God. You have a problem with God. How can you move from burden to blessing? How can you move from worry to worship? How can that happen? Therefore, I want to show you in this passage this morning what Habakkuk does. In order for Habakkuk to arrive to a place of worship, in order for Habakkuk to move from restlessness to rest, in order for Habakkuk to move from having problem with God to fix his eyes on the person of God, in order for Habakkuk to turn from his sighing to singing, like we find in the last chapters, in the last chapter of this book, in order for Habakkuk to, to be a changed man, there was this pivotal moment in his life. What do we see? Verse 1. He stands on his watch post. 2. He stations himself on the tower. 3. What does he do? He looks out to see the answer from God. Those are the three things he does. In other words, 
in all the busyness and the hustle of this life, in all the busyness and the hustle of the temple, in all the busyness and the hustle of the religiosity that was happening at that particular time, Habakkuk says, I will stop complaining. Now, he says, I will take my stand. That's what he does. So I want us to examine these three steps. And these are the three steps that you and I need in this hour. These are the three things that you and I need. These are the three steps, three steps that we need. If we are to be a, a watchful people, a people who are praising God, even when everything else seems to be dark. First thing that Habakkuk does, can you look with me in your Bible? It's in the first line. He takes his stand. And what does he do in taking his stand? He's waiting on the Lord in desperation. That's what we see. He takes his stand, waiting on the Lord in desperation. What, what does he say? He says in verse 1, he says, I will take my stand at my watch post. That's what he says. I will take my stand at my watch post. So the, the prophet here compares himself, he compares himself as, 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 as most prophets of old. The prophets of old who compare themselves as, as, as watchmen. In, in this context, what we find is as they were awaiting the revelations from the Lord himself, they waited with patience. On an imminent watching with an intent eye. So there is this intentional look. There is this desperation in, in Habakkuk. Or there is this great sense of devotion. He is taking his stance and is on his watch post. The watch post is the, is, this is the withdrawal of the whole soul from the earthly allurements and earthly distractions where the prophet now gazes takes his gaze and fixes his gaze on the heavenly things so he takes his stand and he fixes his stance and he's watching he's standing there openly setting himself upon he's watching to see he's waiting it implies here a persevering fixing of Attention. There is a fixity of the attention. He's fixing himself. There is a desperation like the psalmist would say. Like the watchman watches over the morning. Like the, the maid serve, the maid slave watches over to her mistress. Like a slave looking up to his master. So I wait on the Lord. That's the attention there. Then. What do we see? He's standing on the watchtower, standing on the Lord. And this word, it's used by Jeremiah, the contemporary of, 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 um, of Habakkuk. Jeremiah would say these words um, in the book of Jeremiah, as we find in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 6, verse 17, the Lord would tell Jeremiah, the Lord who speak through Jeremiah to say, I have set watchmen over you saying, pay attention to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, speaking to the people of Israel, we will not pay attention. That's what Israel would say. And in the book of Isaiah chapter 21 verse 8, this idea of watchmen, prophets being watchmen, standing on their watch tower. As, as we see here, so they are standing desperately waiting for the Lord, desperately waiting for a revelation of God. That's what we see here. So he takes his stance, waiting on the Lord in desperation. In Isaiah chapter 21 verse 8, Then he who saw cried out, Upon a watchman I stand, O Lord, continually by day, and at my post I am stationed whole night. This is Isaiah crying out to the Lord, and he's crying out saying that he has stood as a watchman standing. So Habakkuk and Jeremiah have, have, have said, even in my introduction, they were contemporaries of each other. Habakkuk here is giving a preview of the coming attractions while Jeremiah fills in the details of the full future. 
And what we see in this particular passage, so Habakkuk comes and he stands and he waits on the Lord. He stands as he is waiting as a watchman on the on the Lord as he waits to hear what the Lord is going to say. Now, in order for Habakkuk to move from worry to worship, Habakkuk had to stand still. You see, in order for us to, to get to a place where we can worship God in spirit and in truth, in order for, for us to move from that place where we, we stop complaining and we start praising God, we need to stand still. And I'm going to come to the application of that. So he stands still to wait on the Lord. But secondly, he stands still as a watchman. A watchman stands still not only to wait on the Lord, but a watchman stands still as a watchman. A watchman is there, secondly, not just to wait on the Lord, but he waits to hear. But after hearing, he has to warn the people. Of the impending danger. So firstly he waits in desperation on the Lord to hear what the Lord has to say. But secondly uh, after hearing from the Lord he has to warn the people. That's what Old Testament prophets would do. They are repeatedly referred to as watchmen in Jeremiah 6 verse 17 as we have seen. So watching the, the, as the watchmen then they were to watch over God's people. So they were to wait on the Lord so that they will receive communication from God. Then upon receiving communication from God, these watchmen, then they will, they will speak to the people of God that which they have received from the Lord. Look at it in this way. They were like a man as it is who they would stand on a watchtower. That's what we, we see ne in, that we'll see on the next point actually as well. So their message as a watchman often had the sense of giving a warning to the people. That's what they were supposed to do. So what do we see here, brothers and sisters, is that as we wait in this time, as we Still in this moment when everything seems like it's not making sense. When we have been complaining and murmuring and have been worrying. There's a need for us to pause. Pause and wait on the Lord. Hear what God has to say. In this time there's a need for us to pause not only to hear from God, but Christian, we still have a task. We still have a mission. We still have an assignment. So we wait on the Lord, but we also warn the people of the impending danger. Remember what God has told, has told, has told Habakkuk to say the, the, the Chaldeans are coming. They are going to invade the land. They are going to destroy. They are swifter. Uh, in, in, their horses are swifter. They are messless. They are brutal. They are going to destroy the nations and things are going to get worse. Christian, you and I are to warn the nations too of the impending danger. Our Lord and our Savior would say like this in the book of Ezekiel, speaking to Ezekiel as a watchman. This is what a watchman would do. In Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 17, uh, the, the Lord would tell Ezekiel, Ezekiel is told in chapter 3 verse 17, Son of man, I have appointed you a watchman to the house of Israel. And listen to what God tells Ezekiel, whatever you hear a word from my mouth, warn them from me. So not only is a watchman to wait on the Lord, but a watchman ought to hear from God. But upon hearing that which, if there is an impending danger, which we saw here, we saw in the previous weeks that there was this impending danger that was about to be poured out upon, upon Judah. Ezekiel 33 verse 7. Now as for you son of man, what does God tell him as a watchman? As for you son of man, I have appointed you a watchman for the house of Israel. So you will hear a message from my mouth. And what do, do, does, does he have to do? And you have to give them warning from me. 
you see? So watchmen are there to wait, but watchmen are there to warn as well. And Warren Wisby will tell us this, that the image of the watchman carries a spiritual lesson for us today. What, what does he mean? He says that as God's people, we know that danger is approaching and it's our responsibility to warn people. We are to warn the people of the, to flee from the wrath to come. We are to warn them to, to bear fruit in keeping with repentance if they are Christians. Matthew chapter 7 verse 8 tells us that. We are to warn the people as 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10 tells us. We are to warn the people to, to turn to God from idols, to serve the living God, to, to, to wait to his son, for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. We are to warn the people of the wrath to come. We are to warn the people of the impending judgment of God that is yet to be poured out more than the coronavirus. There is an impending danger that men and women are yet to face. And if you are a non-believer, I want to tell you and I want to warn you, there is the wrath of God that still remains upon you. And if you do not repent, I want you to know the warnings of the word of God. John chapter 3 verse 36, those who do not believe in Jesus, the wrath of God remains on them. All Christians Christians, I want you to know this. We wait on the Lord. We wait on the Lord. We wait on the Lord. We wait to hear from Him. But not only do we wait, but we, we wait to hear from Him. But we also warn those who do not know Him. So we stand on our watch post. Christian, let's not sleep, let's not slumber, let's let's wake up as a watchman over the night, let's attentively, eagerly, zealously, and vigilantly wake, let's awake from our sleep and wait on the Lord and warn the sinners of the judgment that is to come. So that is the attitude in which we, we move from worry to worship, we move from complaining to praising, that's the first thing we do. But what does Habakkuk do secondly? Secondly, he stations himself on the tower. So firstly, he stands on the watch post to wait and to warn. But secondly, he stations himself on the tower. That's what we see chapter 2 verses 1. Literally, what, what the Bible is saying there, it means it's to stand figuratively, to stand firm as in a state of inner strength. That's what it means. Reflecting the fact that one is not moving or running away from something or someone. So this is a man who is stable. So he stations himself. In other words, what Habakkuk is saying there, he said, I'm stationing myself on the tower. In other words, I shall not be moved. Therefore, I have prayed and I have said everything that I had to say to God. Yes, I know that you are righteous. I know that you, you make these Chaldeans who make mankind like fish of the sea, like the crawling things that have no ruler. They, they bring all of their enemies and they hook them. They drag them out with a net. They gather them with a dragnet. They rejoice and they are glad. They sacrifice to their net. They make offering to their dragnet. They live in luxury. His food is rich. Yes, he, he keeps on emptying his net. He mercilessly kills nation forever. Although the Chaldeans would do this. Habakkuk is saying, I station myself at my watch post. You see, that, that, that language that Habakkuk is using, stationing oneself, taking the stance it's, it's, it's in a cardi context. It is, it is known that, that that is with the sense of presenting oneself formally before God. Frequently in anticipation of something. That's what Habakkuk is doing. So he stations himself on the tower. And whenever the Bible uses that word, that word was usually used in the Bible when one is frequently anticipating something major in their lives. And it's used as we see in, in, the, in the commissioning of a new leader like when Joshua 
was, was commissioned to succeed Moses in Deuteronomy 31 verse 14. We also see it in the book of Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 10 verse 19. But also when there's a covenant renewal, there's a covenant renewal, they'll come and they'll station themselves and they'll stand anticipating something. But also when there was a performing of a miracle like in, in 1 Samuel 12 verse 16 or in this present passage, as Habakkuk is stationing himself, he is in anticipation of the revelation from God. So he stations himself on the tower. That's what the Bible says in that line. He stations himself. Habakkuk went to the tower. He stayed there and he is waiting. This may be taken figuratively. As, as some would say, or it may be taken literally that he, he went somewhere in a solitary place. He withdrew from the hustle and the bustle of life. And he went away to spend time alone with the Lord. That's what Habakkuk does. He went to the tower. Can you can can we can we use the tower there as well? Symbolic tower. Uh, Christ is our high tower. You know that we, we, we would be wiser to run to him. Listen to what the book of Proverbs says. 18 verse 10 tells us the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and they find safety. Psalm 18 verse 2. What does the Bible say? The Lord is my rock. The psalmist says he is my fortress. He is my deliverer. He is my God. He is my strength in whom I will trust. Who else is this God? Psalm 18 verse 2. He is my buckler and the horn of my salvation. Who is he? He is my high tower. That's who this God is. So the, the, Habakkuk comes to, 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 to this place where he stations himself on the tower. He stations himself in the Lord. For the Lord is my light and my salvation. The psalmist will say, whom shall I fear? Yes, I hear about the Chaldeans, but it is as if Habakkuk is meditating on the Psalms of David. And he comes, he says, I stay on myself. I shall fear no evil. The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? I will not even be afraid of these Chaldeans. Psalm 61, verse 3 to 4. Listen to what Habakkuk says. Habakkuk says in Psalm 61, verse 3 and 4. For you have been a shelter for me. A strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of your wings. Psalm 91 verse 2. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. So he stations himself. Psalm 114 verse 1 and 2. Blessed be the Lord, my strength, who teaches my hands to war, my fingers to fight, my goodness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and he in whom I'll trust, who subdues my people under me. So this man Habakkuk comes with this confidence in this God and he says, I station myself on my tower. Oh Christian, would you run to the Lord who is our high tower? Do you see every time that the Bible describes tower, Fortress, high tower, it is the Lord who is our tower. There is no safety in anywhere else but in the Lord Jesus. Of all the impending judgment and the dangers that face that mankind is yet to face, but our fortress, our high tower is the Lord. John Trump who say like John Trump who say like this set me firm fast. Set me firm and fast as a champion that will keep his ground upon the tower of or fortress of divine meditation upon God's word, which alone has settling property to compose the soul when it is tempered or unsettled and to lodge a blessed calm, a Sabbath of rest in it 
far above all philosophical consolations. Station me there. Station me there. Isn't that a joy that we have a God who is our strong tower? Oh, Spurgeon will go on to say like this, the city lies wrapped in slumber and no sound is heard among her 10,000 sleepers. But there is one who knows no sleep, nor gives slumber to his eyelids, for he is the appointed watchman of the night, and he keeps to his tower and sets himself in his place, firmly resolved that till the morning breaks, there shall be somebody to keep guard over the city. You know what Spurgeon is saying? There is a need for a Christian to stand on the tower. There is a need for Christians to watch and to intercede for what is happening in the land. There is a need for Christians to wake up from the slumber and they would stand and watch before the Lord. And they would come just like Habakkuk would come and say that I will take my stand at my watch post. I will station myself on the tower though nobody will stand with me but I will stand. Ezekiel 22 verses 30, that's the very same thing that God is saying. I searched for a man in the land who would stand on the gap and who pray for the people, but I found none. But Habakkuk is saying, I will station myself on the tower. And I will wait. So therefore, the man whom God has appointed to be there, such a man must, must consider themselves blessed. Oh, may, may, we, may we rise from our slumber and be as watchmen who are going to be standing and we are going to, to stand on our post and we are going to be able to, 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 to stand and to be able to stand firmly, not be moved by what we see around us, but we will wait on the Lord and we shall not be moved. That we will say with Habakkuk, we'll station ourselves on the tower. That cannot be moved, who is Christ himself. Even if it means that it's only you. Sir, do you know that your family is in danger? Do you know that our city is in danger? Do you know that our generation is in danger? Do you know that God is searching for a man and you are the man? God is sending for a woman and you are the woman to stand in the gap and to pray for your family. Yes, they might not be standing with you. Yes, they might not be there for you. But remember this, that God is on your side. Be encouraged by the words of Spurgeon as he says this. The man who has God as his companion has the best of company. And he that is a solitary watcher for the Most High God shall one day stand amidst, your, amidst yon shining legions of angels. And himself shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of his father. Expect, therefore, he says, if you are a servant of the Lord that you are watching over, you are praying day and night. If you are then a faithful made servant of the Lord, expect this. Sometimes you have to watch alone and be thankful for that position. If God honors you by calling to occupy it. So then what does Abagub do? He stands on the watch post. To wait and to warn. Secondly, he stations himself on the tower and he is firmly waiting to see. And that's what we see thirdly. He looks out to see the answer from God. That's what he does. So he says, I will look out to see. Actually, he uses the word, I will look out to see what he will say to me. And what I will answer concerning my complaint. He's saying, I will look out to see. So God is speaking not to the prophet's outward ear here, uh, but the inward one. When, when we have prayed to God, we must observe what answers God gives by his word. That's what he, the, the prophet is teaching us here. He says, I will look out to see. I have spoken too much, but it's time that God would speak now. And we need to wait on the Lord. See what he will say in his word. 
Because God answers. He answers us and he responds to us. He did not look, can you see here what the prophet did not do? The prophet did not look to the philosophers. He did not look to the Sangomas of his day, the diviners, the soothsayers of the day. He did not look to them. No, he, he looked to the Lord. Can you see as well that he did not look to his troubles? Uh, to, 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 he did not take his troubles to a neighbor or to slink. No, he looked to the Lord. Can you see? He did not go to one counselor up there and try to consult and to, to see maybe another prophet up the Lord. No, he set himself on his tower and he was looking up to the Lord. And he says in that verse 1, I will look out to see what he will say to me. Not what they will say. No, what he will say to me. He looked out to the Lord. And that's what we need. We need that. We need to have a view of God in terms of trial. We need to have a, a greater view of God. We need to recapture our awe of God. We are going to talk about that. We need to recapture our view of God. Your theology matters most in terms of trial. If you have a small God, if you have a mini God, then that your mini God is unable to solve the mega problems that the world is facing. But I want you to know what we call mega problems of the world. God cannot be compared to our mighty God because he's mighty mighty enough than anything else that we've ever seen mighty enough than anything else that we've ever known he is so mighty that we are even encouraged to come before him so like Habakkuk or some of us we need to get up into our watchtower away from the common affairs of the world away from the troubles and the, and we need to get along with God. Some of us, we need to, to get back to the mercy seat of God, the, where we will stay out of the madhouse. We need to look to Christ and not to our problems. And we need to, to, to find a life far more delightful as we do that. You see, when we quit whining and start believing God, we will find peace. When we quit looking to our troubles, but to, 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 to the triumphant Savior, we we will find peace when we quit looking to the authors and the founders of our problems and we start looking at the author and the finisher of our faith then we will find peace we must take our stand at our watch post to station ourselves look to see what he will say concerning what we have prayed are you taking time to ask the Lord to speak to you in the things that you are praying, in the things that you've asked the Lord before? Are you taking time to, to be free enough that you are asking the Lord to answer you? Habakkuk is saying, I will stand. This reflects is there is a conscious choice that Habakkuk is making. Habakkuk is making a volitional choice to keep a look out, to keep his eyes open and to keep his ears open so that he would not miss the answer that the Lord is going to give him. That's what we see there. God did not disappoint his servant. And beloved, he never will disappoint us when we call out to him. So we find encouragement here. This, this, the point that Habakkuk got off by himself and waited uh, for God is to give him an answer to prayer. He got away from the mundane affairs of being a prophet to seek an answer from God. You see, what he was looking for here and what we need is to get off with God alone, to read, to meditate, and to pray. Sometimes we need that, especially now. We need to take a half a day, maybe even two or three days or longer to be alone with God. Sometimes we need to, to fast as well as to pray. Sometimes we need to be in a solitude. And God can speak to us through his word better than when we are caught up in a flurry of activities. You see, uh, it seems as though right now God has put the whole earth on pause. Everything on pause. No PSL. No English Premier League. No NBA. No new movies in the cinemas. No work appointments. No family engagements like weddings, birthday parties. No, it's as if right now the world is on pause. And that's what God has done, isn't it? 
He has put everything on pause. Habakkuk had a strong motivation to pray, but I don't know whether we have that strong motivation to pray. We have had 30 days, but I wonder how, how, how many times you have spent quality time with God. Maybe this extra time that the Lord has given us, use it wisely so that you will seek the Lord. But you see, as a prophet, he had to tell Israel what God's answer to his complaint was. He had questioned God of justice and he needs an answer to the people as for himself. So he's coming before the Lord because he has brought all these complaints before the Lord. But he realizes that these complaints, actually the Lord needs to answer these complaints. Christian, in this time, as we are on the lockdown, I want you to know this. You need to take your stand. You need to station yourself. You need to... To, 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 to watch and to see what the Lord has to say in his word. Immerse yourself in the word of God. All that as God's children we may learn from this ancient prophet, this timeless lesson of waiting and watching for God when the circumstances cause us to be confused. Just as Habakkuk, he was confused. You see many times even as in the business of our lives, we, 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 we have put a lot of focus on ourselves. We, we don't want to wait on the Lord. City life as a way of keeping us busy, keeping us a lot of times that we don't even have time to pray. Isn't it true? Like poor David Tripp will say, we do all we can do to satisfy our cravings, but we don't have time for God. We think too much about our own pleasures. We envy those who have what we think we deserve. That's what we do, isn't it? We pout when we think that we have been overlooked. We manipulate others for our own good. We attempt to work ourselves into positions of power and control. We are obsessed about what is the best for us. We, we, we long to be first and hate being last. We are all too concerned with being right, being noticed, and being affirmed. We find it easier to judge those who have offended us than to forgive them. We require life to be predictable, satisfying, and easy. We do all these things because we are full of ourselves. And we do that very well. We don't even want to wait on the Lord. We don't even want to seek the face of God. And isn't that the reason why the Lord will put us on pause in this time? Like a treadmill, we would put it on pause. Oh, as you look at the streets these days, it's like empty. Nobody is driving. Nobody is going on pause. Isn't that the reason why the Lord has done this? Or some of us, we need to hearken to the command which God gives us in the book of Psalm 46 verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. That's what we need. We need that. I will be exalted amongst the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. Remember that Christian. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So therefore, if, if this is what God expects of us as Christians... If this is what Habakkuk does, that, and, and before we can do any real service to the Lord, and Christian, in my conclusion, I want you to know this. Before we can do any real service for the Lord, we must first all receive our commission from Him. We must all come before Him and stand on the watch post. Wait, then we warn. We must station ourselves on the tower and we must station ourselves in the Lord. That's where our joy is, isn't it? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, rejoice. The, the command is rejoice. The context of our, of, of our rejoicing is in the Lord. And the consummation of our rejoicing is He is at hand. When He comes again, then our joy shall be made full, isn't it? So then we, we wait on the Lord. Then we look into his word. We cannot teach others a right unless we ourselves have been taught of God. We cannot warn others unless we ourselves have, are waiting to see what God has to say. So then Christian, take this to your heart. Take this to your heart today. 
that what we need for us to move from worry to worship, what we need for us to move from complaint to praise, what we need for us to move from pouting to praising, what we need for us to move from um, being a people who are always grumbling before God to glorify God. We need to be still and wait on the Lord. Stand on the post, station yourself, look out and hear from his word. And if you are a non-believer, I want you to know this, that this God we are talking about, this God that you need to stand watch and wait on him, if you will deny him, if you will reject him, if you are not a believer, I want you to know this. As I've said before, I want you to know that the wrath of God remains on you. The judgment that the Lord was about to bring about upon the Judah, those Chaldeans who were about to come and pull out judgment and wrath on Judah, I want you to know there is one greater than the Chaldeans, and his name is Jesus. He is coming back again to execute justice and wrath on all the enemies of God. But as it is called today, he is calling you and I to come to him and repent of our sins. And in doing so, we will have eternal life. Therefore, we can wait with joy on him. We can station ourselves in him, knowing that he is able to answer us. May the Lord God bless us and help us even in this day. So I bow our heads and we pray. Our Father, we thank you and we pray that your name will be honored as holy among us the nations. We ask, therefore, that you help us, that we will stand, we will station ourselves, and we will wait to see that which you would do, even in and through your word. As you work among us, as you answer us, you answer us, O oh Lord, in different ways. You answer us through your scriptures. You answer us through the promptings of your spirit as you speak to us in the scriptures, but also you answer us by using the providence as the act the acts and the things that we see in the world today are transpiring. So we ask of you that you keep our eyes open to that which you are doing, even in your word, but also in our time. It is in Jesus' name we ask and we pray. And may God's people say amen. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you.